Shalom, we are back and we're in the book of Galatians, chapter 1, and we're looking at verses 6 through 9 that deal with the good news of the kingdom. And we want to really focus in on what this message is in relationship to also the false basura that we find popping up throughout the book of Galatians. But we're spending some time trying to figure out what the good news is. And we looked a little bit at um, John and Messiah and the apostles and Paul talking about uh, re repenting and believing the good news. And that repentance was turning back to the Father, turning back to His ways. And we want to find out more about the good news of the kingdom. So today we're going to be looking at actually the king, the aspect of the king when it comes to the kingdom. We've talked about in the kingdom you have a king, you have your people, in this case Israel, you have a place designated um, for the kingdom, a land, which is the promised land defined in uh, Genesis 15. And we also see a Torah, or a law for the people. So these are the four aspects of the kingdom we've been talking about, but we want to look a little bit closer at the king. And according to scripture, um, very early on, we find that within the 12 tribes of Israel, that there is a specific tribe that was designated to be the lawgiver, or the ruling uh, tribe within Israel. And we find that within Yehuda or Judah. And we read about this very early on in the scripture, or at the end of Genesis, but it, this is a very key prophecy about the end days, about the ruling tribe. And Yaakov said to his sons, Gather together so that I declare to you what shall befall you in the last days. This is Genesis 49 verse 1. So Jacob is telling his children, the 12 tribes, to gather together, which is kind of prophetic in and of itself, to hear what will happen in the last days. So this prophecy that he's given is for his, these sons of Israel in the last days. I'm going to pick up in verse 10. The scepter shall not turn aside from Yehuda, nor a lawgiver between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him is the obedience of the peoples. Now this is a very important thing because... Shiloh is tied into the coming Messiah, um, the coming one that's going to bring sh sh peace, which Shiloh is kind of associated, a lot of people think it's another word for peace or shalom. So this king of peace is going to come, and this will be the obedience of the peoples, or the gathering together of the peoples, which is very huge. But it says, until that happens, until Shiloh comes, that there will be, uh, continuously, the scepter shall not depart from Yehuda, nor a lawgiver between his feet, which means his offspring will always be people that are ruling um, lawgivers throughout the tribe of Yehuda. And we see in Yehuda's life when he was willing to step up, and when Benjamin was gonna, the cup was found in Benjamin's sack, that he was willing to step in and basically take the punishment for his brother so his father would not have to bear another loss of a son. And this, this picture of uh, Yehuda's uh, leadership um, is pretty profound when it comes to the king, where the king should be. It should be a righteous king, someone willing to um, serve in the fear of Elohim. And this is, is going to be a big point later on. So from Yehuda we see that this um, scepter shall not depart um, until Shiloh comes. And when he comes, actually, it just keeps continuing through this Shiloh. And uh, we're going to continue because we find that the prophecies get narrower and narrower and narrower. We see with the tribe of Yehuda, but with the family of David, we find out that this scepter or the kingship belongs to a family within the tribe of Yehuda. And this is very important. So we're going to go, we're not going to read all of these. I highly recommend that you read the whole chapters of Second Samuel chapter 7. But I'm going to just read just a couple of verses here. Um, this is 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. And your house and your reign are to be steadfast forever before you. Your throne is established forever. And this is talking about David. And you can read the whole chapter. We're going to be talking about other aspects of this covenant. Um, but I'm just giving you enough to go, go home and look this stuff up for yourself. And you're going to find a lot more information than I'm covering even today. But the key point here is through David, there's a covenant that actually goes beyond the end days. And it goes on 
forever. And that's a really important point. And I want to pick up also in the psalm. I'll read Psalm 89, which you want to, again, read the whole psalm. I'm just going to pick a few verses here. I'm going to start in verse 3. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen and have sworn by my servant David, I establish your seed forever, and shall build up your throne to all generations, Selah. That's verses 3 and 4. I'm going to continue reading from verse 29 to 37. And I shall establish his seed forever, and his throne as the days of the heavens. If your sons forsake my Torah, and do not walk in my right rulings, if they profane my laws, and do not guard my commands, then I shall visit their crookedness with the rod, and, the, and their crookedness with flogging. But my kindness I do not take away from him, nor be, a, be false to my trustworthiness. I shall not profane my covenant, neither would I change what has gone out from my lips. Once I have sworn to my, uh, by my set apartness, I do not lie to David. His seed shall be forever and his throne as the sun before me. Like the moon, it established forever, and the, witness, it, uh, and the witness in the heaven is steadfast. Selah. So we see that this covenant with David is a for, uh, an everlasting covenant. It goes on forever. That he's going to establish the throne of David. Um, and we're going to get more into the details of this here in a second. But it's an everlasting covenant. Even if the children of David rebel against Torah and reject Torah, that he was still going to be steadfast to his covenant. And this is actually what happens. They do rebel. And there's some very interesting things that happen later on. We're going to talk about that. But we're, he says even here that he's still going to honor the covenant he has given to David. So we'll want to look at that. I want to actually bring up another scripture I didn't put down on the board here. But in Deuteronomy, um, Debarim, chapter 17, this is about the, um, the kings. And uh, Moses had prophesied that Israel will want a king once they come into the land. And he gave some uh, instructions in Deuteronomy uh, 17, 18, this is through eight, uh, verse 18 through 20. And it shall be when he sits on the throne of his reign um, that he shall write for himself a copy of this Torah in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites, or the Luites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life. So he shall learn to fear Yahuwah, his Elohim, and guard all the words of this Torah and these laws to do them, so that his heart is not lifted up above his brothers, and so not to turn aside from the command, right or left, so that he prolongs his days in his reign, and he and his children in the midst of Israel. So we have some insight that Moses even prophesied before even this covenant with David, which would be selected to David's family, that these were supposed to be righteous kings. They were supposed to be like um, um, the Melchizedek, um, uh, we, we hear about um, Melchizedek, or, or the king of righteousness visiting Abraham, and uh, which was the king of Salem, then we see later on that David, the capitals, moved to Jerusalem, this picture of the righteous king ruling over Jerusalem, and this picture goes throughout the scripture, but they were supposed to be righteous, meaning they're supposed to be following the Torah, and this is very, very important. Let's, let's fine-tune this even more to the prophecies of one coming through the line of David that uh, basically has the right to rule. And we can find this in the book of Isaiah. And I'm going to read this from Isaiah chapter... We'll start on in Isaiah 7, verse 14. Therefore, Yahuwah himself shall give you a sign. Actually, let me back up. I'm going to read verse uh, 7, 13 first. And he said, Hear now, ye house of David. So he's talking about, this is about the house of David here. It is a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my Elohim also? Therefore, Yahuwah himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, 
and he shall and he um, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means El with us. Uh, butter and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Now this is interesting because there's a prophesied son that's coming through the line of David, who would be Emmanuel or El with us, with who, with Israel. From the house of David. And this is very important to understand. And that he from um, that he would be um, raised basically on butter and honey. And this is an idiom for the Torah. We know the milk and um, the land of milk and honey. That the honey, the word is like honey, but it's also like butter. It's like milk. It's like the, the he, he was raised on the, the fattest part, the most nutritious part of that, if you want to say milk, that butter that he would know to refuse evil and to choose good. So that is very profound. But nevertheless, we're going to move on and learn a little bit more about this prophesied son in Isaiah chapter uh, 9. It also gives us more information about this son. And this is pretty powerful because it's going to talk about the son that's going to come again. This, uh, this is going to be a house of David. This is Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For a child shall be born unto us. Now again, this is talking about Israel, specifically the house of Yehuda. A son shall be given unto us. And the rule is on his shoulders. Now this is what we're talking about. The rule, the rulership shall be upon his shoulders. And his name is called Wonderful, Counselor, the Strong L, the Father of Continuity, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his rule and the peace, there is no end. Upon the throne of David and, and over his reign to establish it, to sustain it with right ruling and with righteousness from now on, even forever. The zeal of Yahuwah host does this. There is a lot here, but we see through this prophesied son that not only would he be Emmanuel with us, that great L, but he would be establishing the rule. He would be establishing, uh, really, the kingdom um, on the throne of David. And this is really, really significant. And we're going to get into this a little bit more as we go on. But it narrows down this son that was supposed to be born of the virgin. And that he has the right to rule. But this is also an everlasting covenant. It goes on forever. It doesn't end. And his uh, kingdom will be established on righteousness again. We know righteousness is uh, Torah, the, the word, basically. It, that's the foundation. The kings were supposed to uh, keep and uh, read and keep the Torah. So both, we see all this stuff is going on basically forever. These are everlasting covenants. Nevertheless... Later on, we see some problems, which we're going to get to. But I want to show the end game. Well, what's, what is it going to look like at the very end when, this, when Shiloh, this prince of peace that Isaiah says, comes and sets up his reign and has the gathering and obedience of the people? We see Isaiah actually prophesies about this as well at the end. And we can expect this, because this is very powerful, what the kingdom will look like at the latter days. This is Isaiah 2, uh, 2 through 5. And it shall be in the latter days that the mountain of the house of Yahuwah is established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of Yahuwah, the house of the Elohim of Yaakov, and let us... Let him teach us his ways, and let us walk in his paths. For out of Zion comes forth the Torah, and the word of Yahuwah from Jerusalem. And he shall judge between the nations, and shall reprove many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither teach battle any more. O house of Yaakov! Come and let us walk in the light of Yahuwah. This is a prophecy at the end of the days where this Shiloh comes and this Prince of Peace comes and turns their swords and their pruning 
instruments. And we see that he sets up the obedience of the people, but he also, he's going to gather the people together. That Torah will be all over the earth. It will go out from Zion. And it's interesting because in Revelation 14, we see the remnant, the 144,000, with the Lamb on the mountain. And it's really powerful. And I may read that real quick. It's just uh, Revelation chapter 14. Let me get there real quick. I looked and saw the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him the 144,000, having his Father's name written upon their foreheads. So here we see at the end of the age, the 144,000, which actually represent the government of Yah, because the number 12 represents government, and 12,000 from each tribe of Israel um, shows that he established his government, his kingdom upon the earth. But what we're going to look at now is that many of you probably know the story of uh, David and his lineage, that even though this promised son was supposed to come through the seed of David, that there's some very interesting things in the prophecies that there was 14 generations to Josiah and the scriptures in Matthew also mention uh, 14 uh, generations from the exile to Yahushua Messiah. And really what happened in this exile is that the, the uh, house of David basically became cut off. And we're going to read about it here in a second. So this tree, this house of David that was flourishing under David basically was cut down to a stump. It literally was pretty much um, removed, removed from the land, sent in exile, and looked pretty pretty hopeless, basically just a stump. And, um, we, and it looked like, how is this prophecy of David uh, ruling forever is going to ever happen? You know, it looks like, not, it looks impossible, it looks like they're just doomed after they were sent into exile to Babylonian captivity. And we read about this in the book of Ezekiel, and I'm going to read this real quick, in chapter uh, 21, verses 25 through 27 is written, O thou profane wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come when iniquity shall have end. Thus says Yahuwah, Elohim, Remove thy diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he whose right, uh, until he comes whose right it is, I will give it to him. Until he he comes whose right it is, I will give it to him. It's referring to the right of the king because basically. What's happening is that he was talking about the princes, the kings of Israel. They were wicked, that he was going to cut it off. He was taking off the crown. He was removing it. He was overthrowing it. And he was going to wait until the right of the one who comes to uh, take up that crown. And I want to actually add another scripture in the book of Zechariah. And let me find it here real quick. There's a prophecy of the coming king whose right it is to rule. And the cool thing about this is, in the book of Zechariah, it actually gives us the prophesied name of Messiah here. And it tells us that not only the name of the Messiah and the king, the branch, and the servant, but it tells us that he's going to rule on the throne, that he will be a king and a priest. And this is very powerful, and there's a lot here, so you can spend a lot of time in Zechariah chapter 6. And I'll start in verse 11 through 13. And you shall take the silver and the gold, make a crown, and set it on the head of Yahusha. And if you look up this word in the Hebrew, it is a yod Hey wash That's the name right there. And now watch this. This is fascinating. Uh, and set it on the head of Yahusha, the son of Yahu um, Zadik, Yahu Zadik. Um, which is interesting because that word is um, Yahuwah, our righteousness, basically. And the high priest, this is a priest. He's setting this crown on the, the, the head of this priest. And, and, the, and shall speak to him, saying, Thus 
says Yahuwah of hosts, See the man whose name is the branch. This man, Yahusha, is the name of the branch. We'll talk more about this branch later. And from his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the heckel of Yahuwah. So the branch is going to build the heckel of his dwelling place of Yahuwah. And it is he who is going to build the heckel of Yahuwah, and it is he that is going to bear the splendor. And he shall sit uh, and rule on his throne, and shall be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. He's a priest and a king. This is a prophecy about Yahushua Messiah coming in the order of Melchizedek, but also being the king of, of, of Yehuda, uh, of Israel, from the line of Yehuda. And this is very powerful because it tells us the name of the prophesied Messiah, the prophesied king, who is the branch, who we find out later on is the, also the servant. And all these things are interconnected. It's really powerful. So we're going to go back to the book of Hosea real quick. I want to show you that it was also prophesied that um, the kingship would come to an end um, of David for a period of time. And this is interesting because the book of Hosea is prophesied to the northern house when they were sent into exile. And we'll get into this more later. But in chapter 3, verses 4 through 5, it is written, For many days the children of Israel shall remain without sovereign. And this is king and without a prince, and without slaughterings, without pillar, and without shoulder garment, or house idols. Afterwards, the children of Israel shall return, and seek Yahuwah their Elohim, and David their sovereign, or king, and fear Yahuwah and his goodness in the latter days. So this is still in our days right now, the latter days, that many from the house of Israel are going to return to Yahuwah and his ways. But you also see, even though the kings have been removed, even the northern house, the, the kings of Israel, also the kings of Yehuda removed, but in the latter days, they will uh, also seek David, their sovereign, and the, the king. And this is interesting, um, and uh, we're going to be talking about it more here in a second. Also in Jeremiah, after Jeremiah prophesied the destruction of basically Jerusalem and the temple, um, that, you know, if they don't repent, if they don't keep Torah, that they're going into exile. Of course, the people did not repent. Jeremiah also, after re uh, repentant destruction upon the house and Israel, and that they were going to go into captivity, he also prophesies hope of the renewed covenant in Jeremiah 31. Then later on in Jeremiah 33, at the end of that chapter, he also prophesies about um, uh, Yaakov, and also David, and uh, even the Luites as well. But I'm going to start in uh, Jeremiah 33, verse 23, to the end of the chapter, where it's written, And the word of Yahuwah came to Yermiyahu, saying, or Jeremiah, Have you not observed what these people have spoken, saying the two clans which Yahuwah has chosen have been rejected by him? So they have despised my people, no more to be a nation before them. Thus says Yahuwah, If my covenant is not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the laws of the heavens and earth, then I would also reject the descendants of Yaakov and David my servant, so that I should not take of his descendants to be rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. For I shall turn back their captivity and have compassion on them. This is loaded because he's basically saying, I have created the stars, the, the laws of the heavens and earth, and those things have not passed away. He has not rejected his people, uh, Jacob or uh, Yaakov or Israel. He's also not rejected um, David. Matter of fact, earlier he talks about he's going to increase their seed even more, that their descendants would be many. But I want to have you pay close attention about what he says about David. I should not take of his descendants to be rulers over the descendants of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That it's prophesied that through David's descendants there would be rulers over all the way through. Even though not everyone's going to be a king, there would always be rulers from the tribe of um, Yehuda slash the family of David. And this is really, really important to understand because even when Israel went into captivity, with the Babylonians, we see Daniel 
from the tribe, the royal line from David, that he was still a ruler, um, that he was put in a place of authority. Later on, we even see when the remnant through Cyrus got the decree to go back and to uh, rebuild the temple, that a remnant went back with Zerubbabel, which is also part of this Davidic family. Actually, he's in the genealogy of Messiah, that uh, he was basically a governor, a ruler, and helped the remnant restore the house of Elohim. This is very prophetic, but they would return. And we see this throughout the scripture. And this is important to understand because when we get to Messiah, Yahushua Messiah, his mission was not to start something new, but to restore and re establish the kingdom that we read about in Isaiah 9. And we've already talked about this, but when he appointed the twelve, he was following the patterns of Moshe in Numbers chapter 1, where he appointed twelve rulers over the twelve tribes of Israel. We see the same government thing happening with Messiah when he appointed the twelve, which he tells in Matthew 19 and Luke 22 that they would be uh, rulers over the twelve tribes of Israel. They'll be heads over the twelve tribes. He also appointed 70 after the uh, pattern of Moses in Numbers 11, where uh, it says the eleven or the 70 that uh, he, uh, he would pour his spirit upon them to help take the burden off of Moses. Well, we see that Yahushua Messiah, when he was here, he was establishing his kingdom. He was establishing order right from the beginning of his message. So, as Isaiah tells us through the, the root, this, this 